Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world after having spent some time putting up our little campsite over there on that hilltop. And it is just a short jaunt from our house, which makes it perfect for our campfire stories. And once some of the trees have grown up a little bit, we will start using that to tell some of those stories. In between episodes, I have been busy with the saplings here. I'm trying to get some Crimson King maple seeds to get some color into our sapling collection. And I have been a little bit busy on the inside of the house. I've done some cleanup of our interiors. I have more of the trim in place here. So our second floor is mostly trimmed. Ignore this room. But our bedroom has a trim, and so does the second bedroom. And the stairs are a little more put together. I even have a little more of this ceiling going on here. And I kind of have it angling toward the frame around the window so that it doesn't block the view of the window. And I put some more thought into what should go up in our third floor. And I thought that rather than one large area or two areas with a hallway, I figure, why would I put a hallway here if it doesn't go anywhere? And so I thought it might be better to just split these rooms up down the middle and have a door here and a door here and then maybe a door here for something else. Maybe attic access? I don't know. We'll see. I also went and jazzed up the entrance to our bridge a little bit, including curling this railing around here just a little bit. And as you can see, what I did was I added some plaster blocks and then cut them down half size. So we have a two block wide walkway here, but it is centered on a single block. And I like it. I think it adds some much needed definition to the entranceway to our bridge on both ends. However, the interior of the house is not the topic of today's episode. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? I feel it. I'm definitely feeling it. I'm feeling green with envy. I want to do something green today. And I hope you do too, because today's episode is all about things that are green. Which is unfortunate that it is autumn now, because now the grass is all brown and not green. But whatever, we'll make do. And today, I want to get into a new building we haven't touched on yet. I want to work on some greenhouses. And I've been thinking about where to put these. And I've been thinking about maybe out here beyond the barn, stretching off in this direction a little bit, and maybe terminating here. I want to do a couple greenhouses. Oh, that's a hole. Okay, way to go me, way to go. Greenhouses do have a major function in the game, but I don't know that we're going to use them primarily functionally. I think I want them more for completeness sake and to bring something new to our little area. But before we talk about greenhouses, I want to show you what I've been working on with our barn. As you can hear, we have a lot of little piglets who run screaming whenever we're near. And we have... Oh, oh, they're growing up. Look at that. Growing up right before our very eyes. I've been breeding up all of our animals, and now they're all grown up. Great. And they're all out of the pen. Perfect. Including our sheep. And we now have several Tier 2 and Tier 3 Bighorn ewes. I've been asked about dairy products, especially cheese, several times in the past. I've been holding off on covering it because I wanted to wait until we had enough sheep to make it worthwhile working with, as well as to breed up the sheep to a generation where they'd actually give us milk and not kick us while they're doing it. So when you're working with a sheep to get dairy products, you need to know that sheep only produce milk for 20 days after they've given birth, so you will have to keep a constant turnover of new lambs in order to keep your dairy coming in. On top of that, generations 0 and 1 sheep are a lot less likely to give you milk and are a lot more likely to kick you in the face while you're trying to milk them. Once you get to generation 2, which we have several of here, your gen 3s, I think these two are gen 2s, yep. Generation 2s are where it gets sort of worthwhile to milk the sheep. You have about a 50-50 chance of getting milk each time you try, and they don't typically get that aggressive even if you fail to milk them. Where they get real nice is Generation 3. 
they're still not 100% milk each time, and they still might become aggressive, but I think the chance is something like 75% for milk and 25% aggressiveness, so much better than the Generation 2s. And this will get even better over further generations. So, milking sheep, how to do it? Need a bucket, of course. Now, I recommend something due to a quirk in the game, is that if you have just one bucket in your hand and you milk a sheep, for some reason there's a bug that gives you 9.89 liters of milk, and you can't do a whole lot with that. However, to get around this issue, at least in the current version, you can carry extra buckets, and that way when you milk the sheep, the milk will fill the bucket to the full 10 liters, and it will be pulled off the top of the stack and put into a new slot, and that way you'll actually get the 10 liters you want. So make sure you always have at least one more bucket than you plan to use for milking the sheep, and note that buckets only stack to four. But milking sheep is easy. All you have to do is hold down right-click with the bucket, and blam, instant milk. And like I said, the Generation 3 sheep are likely to give you milk. We'll try a Generation 2 and see what happens. Oh, you cooperated. Wow. And one more. Well, that is the first time I've milked these guys that didn't get angry at me. At least once. But sometimes what will happen is that when you try to milk the sheep, they will kind of snort at you and the bucket will spring back into your hand empty. And it'll say you failed to milk them. And you need to give them a minute or two to cool down before you try again. No big deal. Just don't stand next to them. This is why I build this ledge up here, is that I can walk around these guys and do everything I need to do without actually getting too close to them. And once you have your milk, you can just drink it. It's something like 150 saturation per liter of milk, and you'll drink, I think, one liter at a time. But people have been asking me about cheese, not drinking milk. So let's fill these barrels up. There we go. And I have been filling these over the past several days with milk just to get prepped for this episode. And today, our onions have just finished pickling, so we can go ahead and use these now. So we're going to grab these guys, and these will last a good long while in your inventory. 35 days in inventory, or as you saw, it was about a year and a half if we leave them in the barrel here. And I think if we put them in one of these guys, that's not full, they last 1.7 years, so even better. Now, each full barrel of milk will provide you two wheels of cheese. A single wheel of cheese requires 25 liters of milk, and in order to start that process, we're going to put in two pickled onions. Basically, one pickled vegetable per wheel of cheese. And we're going to seal it, and it will turn into 50 liters of curdled milk after three days. So we're going to go ahead and do that to both of these, and we'll come back in three days, which will probably be during the same episode that we're in now, and we should have curdled milk, and we will then move on from there. So, greenhouses. Although I've figured out about where I want them to go, I do want to start laying out this area a little bit first, just to make sure that when I have all the buildings I want, they all line up and don't look silly and don't lead to roads that are too squiggly. I don't mind some organically shaped roads, but I don't want them to be too cramped, too squiggly, because this is sort of, you know, this is a planned area. This is a nice, rich estate. This isn't a slum in a city with a thousand little alleys and things. This is some rich dude's estate. I mean, look, I got four windmills. Gotta be rich to have that kind of cloth. Let's go ahead and lay out a bit of this road. I want our driveway to come up here, and then I want it to have it split. It will come and meet this pathway. It'll come past up here, and up here. And I think I'm going to have it split here, and it will come this way eventually. And over here we'll put, I guess, additional buildings that I haven't really thought of yet. But we will have a road that goes off this way. And then, from here, I want to have it come and circle back in a pretty wide loop. And then it'll come back and past the barn. Maybe not quite that close. And then back to here. And it will also connect up to our patio whenever we finish actually walling this in. And then, that means that up here somewhere is where we'll branch off to have our greenhouses. 
I'm thinking, let's just put this here. I think we can work with this. Let's maybe start them right around here. And let's pretend that right here is where our path's going to be. In fact, we don't need to pretend because we can just lay out some path. So let's assume this is our path, and we'll put our limestone gravel on either side. And we're going to have to clear you, buddy. Sorry. So this is our path here. We can go up to, say, I don't know, here, and... Oh my. I don't see any of them. But I sure do hear them. And then let's branch off from here. Let's say our path goes to right here. And the same goes for here. So let's get to laying out one of these. I'm thinking this one, because it's a little farther from the wolves. And let's see what we come up with. And we will get this designed. Now, greenhouses, like the other kinds of room types in the game, such as cellars and rooms for warmth and winter, also follow the same 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven maximum size. Their walls must be solid, but doors are okay, and you cannot have any chiseled blocks as part of the floor, walls, or roof. And the roof must be at least 50% transparent blocks that have an unobstructed view of the sky. This means that you can use glass, colored glass, quartz glass, and even glacier ice if you can get it. You can use slabs as long as you're using them for the walls or the roof and not the floor, because the floor must be full blocks, farmland, or path blocks. And you have to make sure that there are solid blocks beneath the farmland and the path blocks. Do note that if you are going to be using slabs on the roof, you only want to use the upper slabs because there's a bug that prevents lower slabs from actually counting as sealing the room. That being said, you can have greenhouses share walls with other greenhouses. Furthermore, flatter roofs are recommended. You don't have to build just a box, but you want the total difference in roof block height to be three blocks or less. Otherwise, you might not get the actual bonus from having a greenhouse. So what does the greenhouse do? The greenhouse increases the effective temperature inside by 5 degrees Celsius. This means that you can have a slightly longer growing season, and you can potentially grow crops that might prefer warmer weather, like rice or soybeans. The downside is that crops are not watered when it rains because you have a roof, so you have to use irrigation or manual watering. And irrigation, of course, caps at 75% moisture. You can grow fruit trees in greenhouses, as long as you make sure the roof is the maximum height, at least in the center. However, the temperature adjustment, as of this version of the game, only applies to the vernalization temperature and does not help protect the tree in cold winters. So on our ridge, for example, we're not going to want to grow anything that requires any warmer weather than we already have, and our summers cap out at about room temperature, so no orange trees for us. Okay. Aside from the growls of the drifters, I think I have the bones of this design in mind. I want to have four greenhouses in a cluster, and we will do a second greenhouse over there, just like this one. And each interior is 7x7. Seven seven. And something that I left out a moment ago was that the farm blocks, the blocks we're walking on, do not count as the floor. The block beneath them is the floor. So from our perspective, our greenhouse will max out at six blocks height interior. However, the reality is that that's because the floor is treated as being one block below your farmland as far as insulation is concerned. So now we need to start thinking about what we're going to use for the walls. And I figure a traditional greenhouse is going to use glass, but we have a couple other options, and one of them is a green glass that we haven't touched on yet. During the course of our travels, we have come across deposits of olivine. Olivine is a green glassy material that occurs primarily in peridoite, but we do know of a deposit over here near our pink marble deposit that we know about. And olivine can be smelted down into green glass. 
and I think I would like to use some in our building. The three deposits we know about are up here, so pretty close to home, and we know about one down here near our clothing merchant, and then we know about one down here near the second artisan we have. And this one has not just olivine, but also peridot. So I think I want to hit a couple of these, at least this guy with the peridot. And I might also take a look at the one near our home, because I know that sometimes olivine and quartz can create sort of geode structures. And I want to say, I'm not positive, but I want to say that olivine that is encountered outside of its native peridoite may be more likely to have that sort of geode formation, and I'd like to see if we can find some crystals. So I'm going to put away our things and get our adventuring gear on, and we're going to go and see what we can find there. Okay, it's been a while since we've been to this cave. Let's head on down, and you know what, let's just scatter a couple torches here. Try to keep this place clean. Oh good, we were smart and did that. Excellent. There we go. And here we have olivine in peridoite. And when you mine it, you get these sort of green glassy blobs. And they can be crushed in the pulverizer. And they are used for making the tier 2 and tier 3 refractory bricks for the cementation furnace. But today we are interested in the ability to smelt them into green glass. Now, it takes twice as much olivine to make glass, or green glass, as it does regular quartz to make clear glass. So, this is... Oh, I was right. Oh, look at this. Is this cool or what? We found ourselves a little geode. I'm going to pick up as many of these crystals as I can get my grubby little paws on. Because these are just so cool. This is actually the first time I've ever seen crystals in-game myself, personally. So I am very excited to see this. And I think this is probably just a small deposit. Wow, okay. So we are going to have to go farther afield to get the rest of our olivine, but this was a great start. And while I could blast this with the blasting bombs, those will destroy the crystals. So, for now, I'm going to just mine the rest of this out by hand, just in case we come across any more crystals. I don't think we will, because this seems to be the end of it, but just in case. Okay, that is it for this little geode. So, let's just pillar our way out of here. I'm going to go and drop off these goodies at our home, and then we will get moving on to our second location, which I think will be the one that has Peridot actually in with the olivine. It's a bit farther away, but I think it'll be worth it. Okay, we are here, and that wasn't too bad of a jaunt, but it's time to figure out how to get down at least somewhat safely. So this is the one and we found trace amounts of peridoite. The peridoite tends to be scattered throughout the entire deposit, and given how hilly it is here, this deposit might also be kind of spread out vertically. So, so we're going to go in and look for this peridot. If you've seen the iron mining episode, then you should be pretty well prepared for this one, because look at the size of this olivine deposit. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. But right here, I have found our first peridot. And this is high grade, so when we break it, we're going to get a high grade peridot stone out of it. Now, I would like to get at least a sample of rock. But for now, we are going to break this one, because I do believe there is more peridot scattered throughout here. I've tested it with the Propic all along here, and there's 
definitely some back here too, which is far out of range of that block, so we'll go ahead and grab this guy. And there you go. We have our very first... Oh! We got a low-grade peridot. Oh well. <laughs> I didn't know that could actually happen. What should break you? Did we get a better one? There we go. We got a medium one. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep mining this out, and we're going to get some peridot. And I want to get at least one sample of peridot itself, just to have a block of it. And we will package this up and head home after I do some more mining and some blasting, probably. And boy, am I glad that I didn't start blasting yet, because we just hit a second little geode. Now that's exciting. Cool. Okay, well, our inventory is getting pretty full. We have a completely full chest at the beginning of our workspace here. So I think now is a good time to start packing up. I'm just going to grab all of our torches. And we are going to head back home and put this olivine to work. I thought I was recording, but I wasn't. Thanks, OBS. Anyway, luckily I only did one of these. But we just got home and I checked on our curdled milk, which says it is, quote, fresh for eight days. Probably it for me to understand how curdled milk can be considered, quote, fresh, but hey, whatever. Anyway, what we have to do next is we have to put five salt into it. One for each 10 liters of curdled milk. And then we'll seal it for one day, and it will become cottage cheese. And we're actually getting pretty close to the end of the cheese making process here. So by the time we get these greenhouses up and running, we will certainly have some cheese at least curing on the shelf, if not ready to eat. Now I am going to put the salt away and put our olivine away and otherwise get ready for processing it into green glass. So we made it back with over a full chest of olivine as well as the crystals we found which I put over here. There we go. So a tidy little sum of crystals here. And we're going to get to processing this olivine. That, of course, begins just like any other glass. We need some bloomeries. Now, as I mentioned before, olivine smelts into green glass at half the rate that regular quartz smelts into regular glass. So we're going to burn through this olivine pretty quickly. And we're going to fill each one of these with 48 olivine. And each of those will give us 12 pieces of green glass. So let's go and fill these up. And then charcoal. And then fire. So I think while those are cooking, I'm going to go and get a little more of the design work done on the greenhouses, because I have come up with a couple ideas for the decorative bits of the greenhouses that I hadn't thought of last night. So let's see what we can do here and turn this from a bunch of vertical logs into an actual building. So I'm not 100% sure of this design just yet, but I think what I want to do is I want to try using some of the peridoite that we just mined a whole bunch of, and I want to line the bottom of this with this sort of green-looking cobblestone. And then we'll make a little lip. Just like that. So it kind of looks like there's, you know, some older, maybe mossier stone. It's been closer to the ground, so the moss and mildew is growing from the grass onto the cobblestone. And that way we'll also have, from the inside, when we make the farmland, since that block is just a little bit shorter than a full block, we'll have visibility of stone rather than just dirt. So I think I want to try lining this whole area with that. And then we'll fit our windows and some of our green glass up here. There we go. I think that works pretty nicely. As the wolves howl in the very near distance. So let's start planning out the roof here. And we're going to want some ladders for that. So I want the roof to come up, up to the six block maximum. And I guess I could have been smart about that and pillared up, but I didn't. So there's our six block max right there. So then we can do a bit of this. 
get an overhang. And we're going to need some more logs here in a minute. But we can start the process of getting this roof in. And I think I want to have one central beam and then probably just fill in the rest of the roof with glass. And I'm thinking we'll do like a somewhat curved roof. We'll see what we can do considering the limitations of greenhouses and glass and the funky rules that go along with those. Here we have our roof beams and I got some lanterns so we can see what we're doing here in the middle of the night. And I think this is the roof line that I want. I want to have it kind of curved down the middle and then back up so we have sort of two barns kind of smushed up against each other. So I want to get some glass because I just got an idea that might help us make a more attractive roof. Because usually when it says an unobstructed view of the sky, usually glass blocks don't count. So I'm wondering if we can stack some glass blocks, or glass slabs specifically, to make it look like we have a rounder roof than would normally be allowed. Now for the roof, instead of the olivine, I was thinking we could use some clear quartz instead. Because in a greenhouse, you want to have a roof that diffuses the light, otherwise you can end up cooking your plants. So I'm thinking that the foggy glass that the clear quartz makes would be perfect for that. So let's try that out and see how it looks. So normally we would be required to start here and just have our roof be like this. And that results in that sort of blocky roof style that I want to avoid, if at all possible, because then we have that sort of full meter drop. But if we can stack an extra block on top of that, like so, then we can have the next block just be like this, and then our next one would end up being something like this. We can then finish this off with just a few more of these, like so. That way we have a nice sort of rounded roof that comes down. Since we're going to have a frame here, we won't notice the single block, and if it gets in the way, we can maybe double it up too. I'd put one right down here if we did that. But I don't really see a need to unless it looks really bad from the outside. And yeah, if the game will let us do this, let's do it. But I think we can find out soon because... When I was returning from this glass run, I saw that our olivine is done. So we now have 12 green glass in each of these, giving us 120. But let's go ahead and break these down and get our green glass out. Look at that. Nice, clear green glass. Very hot glass, somehow. My hands can take it. Now, before we get to the implementation of green glass as windows, I did want to show you one neat little trick you can do with green glass, and actually any colored glass, is that if you have a lantern sitting out in the world, and you have a piece of glass that's colored, you can right-click, and you get a green lantern. Or if you have blue glass, a blue lantern, and so on. And it actually changes the color of the light, both when it's placed in the world, just drop this, and when you carry it. So if you want to have some neat RGB effects, because your bright keyboard isn't quite enough, you can carry around all manner of different colored lights. Let's just go ahead and we will replace the clear glass into our light. It should be noted that you can't actually make them this way initially. You have to make them with your glass or clear quartz first, and then you can put the glass inside it. So I'm going to go ahead and put in basically two layers of this olivine glass, and I will cut it into slabs, and we will just ring this entire area with olivine. I think for the windows in between sections, I might just revert to using regular clear glass, mostly because I don't want to do a second olivine run and we're not going to be in here a whole lot anyway, so having clear glass here won't make a huge difference. That is very green. My goodness. <laughs> well, I'm going to probably ease up on the use of further green, just so we don't overwhelm ourselves with this rather brilliant 
contrast to the rest of our rather drab autumn world here. I was taking a break to go and get some cattail reeds. Let's go. Wrong direction. And let's go milk our sheep one more time. And now they've all grown up, it's kind of hard to tell which is which. Looks like you're one. There you are. Oh, and there we go. So there's the first time since I started recording this episode that the sheep actually ended up being too stressed to milk and kicked me off. And we have to wait 30 seconds to a minute before it becomes milkable, and there she is. There we go. So, hey, we've got our two barrels of cottage cheese, and they stay fresher longer than the milk or the curdled milk. So let's go ahead and drop you guys in there, and we'll get our pickled onions and toss them in here. And for the rest of this, we're going to need some more salt. So let's grab our salt again. We're also going to need one piece of linen. Now, you will get the linen back from what you do here. It also requires a stick, and you don't get that back, but whatever. So let's go ahead, and we're going to put our five salt. And there we go. Now, for the cottage cheese, you can just dip a bowl in, or a bucket, and you can just eat it. And I think you can actually add it to meals as cottage cheese. So we get... 140 saturation from one liter of cottage cheese. That is a lot of cottage cheese. Oh my goodness. Anyway, I'm not sure how a liter fits in this bowl. Enough of that. So we can pick up half of it by crouching and right-clicking with the linen. And then we place it on the floor. And then we take a stick. And we right-click on the stick and hold it. And it will squeeze all of the way out of the cheese, and now we have a curd bundle. We hit it with one more piece of salt, and now we have raw cheese, which we can pick up, and if we had a shelf in here, we could then put the cheese on the shelf to cure. So what we can do is we can then place this cheese on here, and it will be fresh in here for almost 60 days, and in about 20 days it will be ripened, and it will be regular cheese. Now, what else we can do with this? And you see, now we get our linen back. After we squeeze out the juices and pick up our cheese and salt it. Oh, and it takes five more salt, by the way. We can also wax the cheese, optionally. And then we can, again, put it on the shelf to ripen. And you'll see that currently they both last about 60 days, and they both take about the same length of time to ripen. However, when the wax cheese finishes ripening, on the shelf it will last something like 10 years, whereas the unwaxed cheese will last something like a year and a half to two years. So, big difference, but probably won't matter in the long run. So I'm going to go ahead and turn all of these into cheese, and we'll make two unwaxed and two waxed cheeses, just so each shelf contains one kind of cheese. And there we go, our first four wheels of cheese. We'll be ready in... I guess just before Christmas time, huh? Okay, perfect. Well, let's get back to the greenhouses. Okay, and like I threatened, I think what I want to do is I want to use some of this regular glass and we will just fill in this sort of central window area with full blocks of it. And we'll bring that up and bring that up. And then I guess we'll just kind of do this to bring it across, like so. And this will be our view from the inside. I also think that we'll bring this out one more. And I am thinking we'll bring these out an additional block. And that should give the outside some interesting definition. Let's see how that works out. So I've cleared out the area here where I want to have some farmland, and that's going to go in these different areas here. And we're just going to do 32 farmland per section of greenhouse. And in each of these four spots, we'll go a block of water. And I'm thinking, even though we don't need to, I think it would be kind of cool to plant a fruit tree in the center block here. 
And the kind of soil that you plant a fruit tree on doesn't actually matter. It doesn't affect the growth speed or its health or chances of survival or anything. So we can put just regular dirt here and it'll be fine. And for now, because we're still processing our fertilizer in the compost bins over by the old house, I'm just gonna go with medium fertility soil in here for now. This might get pulled out pretty quickly, like maybe midway through next year, but we'll get a harvest or two out of it. Now, before I get too far into getting these double-paned glasses on here, I think I want to seal this up a little bit and just see if it gets the bonus temperature from being in a greenhouse. If it doesn't, we'll fiddle with the design a bit because this can be a little temperamental. And there's also a chance that these path blocks beneath the doors might also be a problem. So if we don't start getting the bonus for being in a greenhouse in a little bit, then I will try that first probably and see if that fixes the problem. And then if that still doesn't work, then we will try replacing the roof, or rather removing some of the extra blocks from the roof. Now the update check that determines whether or not you have a greenhouse only happens a few times per day, so it might be a little while before we get some results here. So I am just going to tell you what, we're going to just control for this now, and we're going to fill these in with regular dirt, and just in case that's an issue. So what will happen is we'll be able to look at our farmland here, and it will say plus 5 degrees Celsius in the info panel. So let's go get some water, and we'll fill those water holes in. Okay, well, I'm going to hang around here for a little bit and start getting the farmland and everything else set up in the other pods, for lack of a better term. And I'll check back regularly and see if that updates. And if not, maybe by noon or so, I will try removing the extra glass panels we have and seeing if that helps. I will bring you all back when I have something to report. Okay, well, it's been about a day, and these have not updated at all. And they do occasionally update kind of like one at a time, but I'm not seeing any of them. So let's just take these off and see if that obstructed the view of the sky too much for it to work. And that might not be great. So let's just drop you in here as well. So we do still have more than half the roof covered in glass. And I think I'm going to grab the... Oop! I grab my ankles and just jump. I think I will grab the glass from the inside here too, just to make sure this isn't causing any issues. Oh, there we go. I wonder if that was it. So, yeah, okay, so the glass was the problem. Okay, I can work with that. I can definitely work with that. So what I think we'll do is, I think I'll do, you got the top slabs here, and then replace these with full blocks. And that should fix our problem. But first, I'm gonna have to go and get us some more clear quartz because I am completely out of clear quartz. I turned it all into quartz glass slabs. Let's get blasting, I guess. Well, everyone, here we have the results of our hard work. Two, well, actually, four greenhouses. And we can pass right through here to the rear one and from any of these to the other adjacent ones. And we have the brilliant green glass in the side walls and the sort of cloudy quartz glass overhead. And then in between the sections, we have the regular glass. And I think we are looking mighty fine. All that's left is to plant us some trees and till the soil. Apple, apple. Cherry. Pear. And there we have it. Our very own greenhouse. Now, unfortunately, if you look at the weather, it's already zero degrees Celsius, and it tends to dip down toward the negative seven to 10 in the night. 
So I think we've actually missed the tail end of the planting season. If we'd gotten in maybe four or five days ago, we might have been able to sneak in a crop of something quick, maybe some rye. But I'm going to leave these barren for now, and we'll let these trees establish, or die, as they will. We will come back to this in spring, and maybe we'll plant something a little earlier. And then in summer, I'd like to maybe plant some rice. We have a few rice seeds that would go well in here, and we could start building up a rice crop. And apparently there's a crop of drifters somewhere, too. Now, before I forget, someone had asked me if I was going to make both cheddar and blue cheese. And unfortunately, the answer, I think, for now is no, or not yet, perhaps. Blue cheese is a different kind of cheese you can make in much the same way as you make regular cheese. However, it requires a somewhat special basement setup that I don't have right now. Namely, it requires a basement that has open air access, but still has a light level of two or less from sunlight. And I don't have that right now, and I'm not really planning on building that at the moment. So for now, we are just going to not have blue cheese. And in any case, the blue cheese is just not as nourishing as cheddar. It's 200 satiation instead of 240. So we will skip that for now, but as time permits, we may get into that for completeness' sake. Anyway, everyone. Oh, and that's right, I have switched into my winter gear. I even made a new shirt and a new pair of pants that each give me 0.5 degree additional warmth. So not much, but maybe it'll help this year. Anyway, that is where we're going to call the episode for today. I hope you enjoyed our adventure in building the greenhouses and the escapades we went on in order to find the materials. I know, I was really excited to find those olivine crystals. Anyway, as always, my new husband Corazar, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.